Well, it's good to have all of you back with us again this weekend. And uh, I can't believe that this day has finally arrived. Uh, this is the last sermon in our entire series that we've been going through in the book of Romans. And uh, I have to admit, it's, it's probably been uh, my favorite study. Uh, the book of Romans is probably the greatest book in the entire Bible for a believer to study and to learn and to get to know. And it has really changed me. I mean, I think it's changed all of us. It has really changed the way that we see our faith and it's really changed the way that uh, we see our walk in the Lord. And uh, so it's, it's pretty, it's kind of a moment, right? <laughs> that we are finally here at the end. We've been in this book for over a year now. I think we've have uh, close to 80 sermons uh, that we've done uh, through the book of Romans, and it has been a pretty monumental uh, year and a half, I suppose it's been uh, about that, that we've been in this book. And so I'm glad that you guys get to be here and get to share in this moment when we get to finish it up. And really what we're going to look at today is we're just going to look at uh, the way that Paul closes out the letter. Uh, we're going to be looking specifically in uh, chapter 16, and we're going to be looking at verses 21 to 27. And uh, so we're going to kind of take it out of order. Uh, we're going to look, first of all, at verses 25 to 27, and then we're going to go back and we're going to pick up verses 21 to 24. So uh, let's look at verses 25 to 27 first. It says, uh, Now to him that is of power... Uh, to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scripture of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. And the, one of the first questions that we had to ask is, why is he so eager to preach the gospel to Christians? I mean, we kind of think that the gospel is for lost people, that you want to give them the gospel, of course, so that they can receive Jesus Christ, so they can be saved. And so why is he so eager to preach it to Christians? And I think that this passage really helps to uh, answer that question. Uh, that the gospel is not just for lost people, but the gospel is for Christians as well. And we see that in verse 25 when he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And that's really what the reason why Paul is so eager to preach the gospel to us as believers is because what he really wants is he wants not just for you to be saved, but he wants you to be, in his words, he wants you to be established as we would say, to be established in the gospel. Uh, that's really what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to receive the gospel just to be saved. He wants you to receive the gospel, but he also wants you to be strong. He wants you to be steady. That's what this word establish in verse 25 means. It means to be fixed. It means to be steadfast. It means to be set in something. Instead of something being weak, and which is able, like a tree, to be able to be blown over by the wind, instead of it, it's a tree that has deep roots that really grow into the ground and that are fixed, and it's able to stand strong even in the fiercest kind of winds. And, uh, and that's what all of us want uh, for our faith. We want our faith to be able to stand strong no matter what it is that comes at us, no matter what circumstances we face, uh, and even in the midst of this mission that we're trying to accomplish, we want to be able to be steady, we want to be strong, we want to be fixed. And it is the gospel that enables us to do that. We want to be steadfast. And so the first lesson that we really learn here is that the gospel is not just to lead lost people to Christ. The gospel is also where the Christian finds his strength. So what gospel is Paul talking about when he says, I want you to be established? 
in my gospel. Well, how does he describe the gospel that he's talking about? Uh, he's talk, he says a, a number of things. He gives a long list of things that would describe it. And uh, so I'm just going to walk through here what he says. And it's really kind of important because we're going to uh, make an important observation about this list here in just a second. So just follow with me if you, as you start in verse 25. He says, this gospel is, first of all, it is the preaching of Jesus Christ. But he also says that it is a mystery that has been kept secret since before the world began. He says, but now it has been made manifest to us. And how is it manifested to us? It's manifested, it says, by the scriptures and the prophets. So he's saying by the Old Testament and the New Testament, the gospel has now been revealed. It was kept secret, right? It was a mystery kept secret in the old, but now through Paul, it's been revealed. And why now has it been revealed? It says it's been revealed by the commandment of God. God has commanded, has seen fit to use the apostle Paul to reveal this gospel to us that all nations can obey the faith. All nations can believe in Christ and can be saved. Now, what's really interesting about this description that he gives is that it is so similar to the way that he started the book. If you look back in Romans chapter 1, and uh, just to see how he started this book, <clears throat> in Romans chapter 1, it says here, the way he starts it is the same way he finishes it. He says, Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So this gospel is still revealed, as he says, in the Holy Scriptures. He says, and what is it about? He says, it's concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which is made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. So his gospel is about the preaching of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And he says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And so you can see that the description of the gospel that he gives in the beginning is very similar to what he is saying that it is here. Uh, he's saying in the very beginning that this gospel that he's uh, committed to, that he's been separated to, was one that was revealed in the prophets and promised in the prophets, is now revealed in him, that he's received this grace and apostleship to reveal this mystery, this gospel that concerns the preaching of Jesus Christ, and for what reason? for the obedience to the faith among all nations. Now, it's so cool the way that Paul started this epistle is exactly the same way that he finished it. So what we can take from that, how we can apply that, is when Paul says that you can be established, that you can actually be made strong as a believer in the gospel, the gospel that he's talking about is the one that he reveals to us in these 16 chapters of the book of Romans. Paul, that's the, one of the reasons why the book of Romans is so important to a believer is because this lays out the entirety of the gospel and this gospel that he reveals by the commandment of God is where you as a believer find your strength and find your steadfastness as a Christian. Think, think about all the things that Paul has covered in this book, right? Because as Christians, what we tend to do is we, we believe the gospel, death, burial, and resurrection. That's what we think of. We, Jesus died, buried, rose again, and we believe in that for the salvation of our souls. And then we want to move on to the problems of this life and try to figure out how we can fix them. And what Paul is trying to say to us here is that the way that you can actually grow strong as a Christian is by going back to the roots of the gospel and never forgetting these roots because that is, it's in the roots of it. That's where you really find your strength. As we mentioned before, a tree that is standing strong in the middle of a storm, where he finds his strength is always going to be in his roots. So you as a Christian, your roots have got to be deep in the book of Romans. 
your, your, your roots have got to be deep in the gospel if you are ever going to be able to stand strong. The Bible talks about that in Ephesians where it says that we don't want to be children anymore that are just tossed about by every wind of doctrine. We also don't want to be the kind of people that are just tossed about in our lives by every single emotion that we feel at any particular moment. What we want to be is the kind of people who are able, no matter what it is that comes at us, we want to be able to be steadfast. We want to be strong. And what Paul tells us here, what he prays for us really, is that God, through his power, is able to establish you and make you steadfast in the gospel. So think about the things that Paul has covered. In Romans chapter 1, just to give you a quick outline and recap of everything that he's explained in his gospel, in Romans chapter 1, all the way through chapter 3 and verse 23, Paul described the sin of man. That's really where he had to start. and we, So we understand through the gospel that the root of our problem is our sin. That is always the root of the problem is sin. The root of our problem is not psychology. The root of our problem is not society. The root of our problem is sin. And so we have to deal with the sin problem before we can ever deal with the solution. And in Romans chapter 3 verses 24 all the way to the end of chapter 4, Paul, having dealt with the sin of man, moves on to the salvation of God. He gives us the solution. We know that the only solution to our problem is Christ and our faith in him. And that doesn't just apply to the wiping away of our sins, but it also applies to our walk. It applies to our entire life. Our problem may be sin, but the answer is always going to be Christ, putting our faith in him, is always going to be the answer to any problem that you're going to face. So the answer, so the problem is not psychology or society, and of course the answer to our problem is not going to be psychology or society. The answer is always going to be in our Savior. That's always going to be the answer. If you have anything going on in your life, you can run to him and he will give you rest. He is the strong tower and we run into him and we are safe in Christ. He is the one who changes us. And Paul goes on and tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, this is probably the biggest chunk, uh, one of the biggest chunks in his entire outline. And here he really deals with the security of a believer. He starts off in Romans chapter 5, telling us how that we are fixed, that we stand fast by our faith in this grace that he has given us in the gospel. And he goes on to explain all of that, leading us all the way to the end of chapter 8, where he makes that famous statement that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so he makes this huge case from chapter 5 all the way to chapter 8, to let you know who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ, that you are a child of God by grace through faith and that there is nothing that can ever change that. He lets us know unequivocally that your salvation has nothing to do with your behavior. Your salvation is based entirely upon the behavior of Christ and not upon yours. All you have to do is just believe, and when you do that, he takes you out of the kingdom of darkness and translates you into the kingdom of his dear son, and it is done by grace alone, based upon Christ alone. That is the firm foundation upon which we stand, and that makes all the difference Whenever you are facing any type of temptation, when you're facing any type of relationship problems, whenever you're facing any type of doubts and fears and trouble in your life, and you, when you want to grow as a Christian, you have to start with the understanding of the foundation upon which you stand. You have to start by knowing that your relationship with God in Christ 
is secure eternally. It is eternally secure and nothing can change that. You have to start with the understanding that you used to be a servant of sin, but you are no longer a servant of sin. Now you are a servant of righteousness. So everything that you do and everything that you try to change in your life has to begin on a foundation that is secure. And if you, if you don't have that, that it makes everything else in your life subject to change. It makes everything else in your life just a little bit weaker. It makes it so susceptible to shift all the time. You have to start with a firm foundation as a Christian, knowing who you are in Christ. And so he goes on in Romans chapter nine, all the way to chapter 11, and he deals with the salvation of Israel because he wants you to know exactly what God's plan is in the world. That it's not just about me getting saved, God actually has a plan, and there's a reason why he's doing what he's doing in the world. The promises were for Israel, they rejected their Messiah, so it says that God set them aside so that he could then go to another, which were the Gentiles, that's us. And their rejection became our blessing. God always intended to reach the world through the nation of Israel, but now they rejected their Messiah. He has gone to the Gentiles, which is us, and now he's going to use us to take this gospel that was intended for all nations, and we are to go to all the world and tell them that if you will just confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, then thou shalt be saved. God is, is, is not just sending his son to save you from your sins. He also has a plan that he is working out for his body in the world. It, God has a plan. And so we need to understand that we are a part of his plan. God is not a part of ours. But he goes on in Romans chapter 12, all the way to verse 16, uh, all the way to chapter 16, where he lays out the service of the believers. So Paul has dealt with the sin of man. He's dealt with the salvation of God. He's dealt with the security of the believer. He's also dealt with the salvation of Israel, demonstrating his plan in the world. And also Romans 12 through 16, he, he uh, lays out the service of the believer. And we here is one of the most important sections because now that we are saved, what are we supposed to do with that? The whole reason why we got saved is so that we could be set apart to serve. So you understand the purpose of your life, that your life is to be set apart to your father, that your life is to be set apart for sin. And the reason why you are set apart is so that you can serve him. The reason why you are here is not to please yourself, Romans chapter 15 but you're here to give glory to your heavenly father. You are here to please him. We are here for him. We are not here for ourselves. The reason why we live is to serve. That's the whole reason why we got saved is because before we got saved, we were always living in service to sin. No matter what we did, no matter how well we did it, it was all gonna be done in service to that king. But now that we've gotten saved, now we're in Christ, we have been freed finally at last so that we can serve Christ. And he has a mission for us in this world to share the gospel, to make disciples all in the context of a unified local church. That's the service that God has for us. And Paul says, this, what I've just explained to you is the gospel. And I want your roots to be deep down and strong in that gospel. So whenever things come along in your life, you can remain steady and steadfast. This is the gospel that Paul wants us to be established in. We are all sinners. We are all saved by grace through the blood of Christ. We are all secure in Christ by his spirit. And we are all set apart to serve. We are to serve with our body. We are to serve in the body of Christ. And we are to serve together to take the gospel to everybody in the world. 
and why. And verse 27 tells us the reason why for all of it. It says, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. As we covered in our series Made for a Mission, this is, our, this is the answer to the why question. The reason why the gospel has been given to us, the reason why we've accepted the gospel, and the reason why we live in the gospel is because we want to bring glory to our Heavenly Father. And Paul says, listen, as a Christian, this is not something necessarily that you move on from. This is something that you're supposed to grow deep into. You need to grow deeper in your understanding. As he told us before, you need to be wise when it comes to those things that are good. You need to be simple toward those things that are evil. These good, solid doctrines that are in the book of Romans, you need to grow more wise concerning your sin nature. You need to become more wise concerning the substitutionary death of Christ. You need to become even more wise concerning your eternally fixed position in Christ. You need to become even more wise according, uh, concerning God's plan in the world and what it is that he has to do with the nation of Israel as opposed to the body of Christ. You need to become even more wise concerning your service to him in the mission. Your roots need to go deeper into this book so that you can be established. And I promise you, the deeper that your roots go, the stronger that you will be as a Christian. Okay, we need to back up just a little bit because there's something else that I think is really quite important that we need to learn in this passage as well. And we see it in verses 21 to 24. Paul says, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater, and my kinsmen salute you. He says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. He says, Gaius, my own host, and of the whole church, saluteth you. Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you, and Quartus, a brother. But right in the middle of all these greetings, you have a statement that kind of pops out that is really important and that we cannot overlook. And that's in verse 22, when it says that, uh, he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. It's, now, that's something where you have to just really put on the brakes and you have to stop and say, okay, wait a second. I thought the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans. What we understand is that Tertius is not really the one who wrote it. The Apostle Paul is the one who wrote it. Uh, and Tertius was uh, the penman. He was the scribe who received Paul's words and Tertius is the one who actually wrote them down. So Paul is the one who spoke the words, and then Tertius was the scribe who put them on paper. Now, this was actually uh, the common practice of how these epistles uh, were written. If you turn over to Jeremiah chapter 36, verses 1 to 4, it says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of, Judah, king of Judah, that the word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah. So God, the Lord is saying, Listen, I'm going to speak these words to you, Jeremiah, and I want you to write all these words down okay, on the scroll right? In verse 3, it says, It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do to them, that they will return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. And what does Jeremiah do? Okay, he's going to follow his instructions, but how does he follow his instructions? In verse 4, it says, Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote, listen, look, look carefully at the words, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of the book. A roll of the book. That's a scroll. Uh, this is often how these letters and these books were written. 
is that when the Lord said, Jeremiah, I want you to write down all these words, Jeremiah didn't sit down and start writing. What he did was he got Baruch, he got a scribe to sit down, and Jeremiah would dictate these words to him, and Baruch was actually the one who wrote it down. And this was always the common practice with Paul. In fact, Paul makes a special note uh, in the book of Galatians, if you see that later in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul makes a special note in the book of Galatians when he points out that he actually wrote that one by his own hand. And the reason why he makes such a special note of that is because it was very unusual for him to do so. Paul usually would use a penman, and then he would often, what he would do is he would write the salutation. He would write kind of the ending, his signature, his benediction at the end. He would write the salutation in his own hands, as he points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 21, and also in 2 Thessalonians 3.17. And look over at 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3 and verse 17, and look what he says there. This is this passage is very instructive. He says, The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token, he says, in every epistle. He says, This is what I commonly do in every epistle. My token is that I write the salutation with my own hand. And that was necessary for authentication so that people would know that it was actually from Paul, that these were Paul's words. But Paul was not the one who wrote the bulk of the letter. A penman would sit down and he would, Paul would dictate this to them and then he would write the letter down on the paper. That was, Paul, that was Paul's common practice. So that's what Tertius is talking about here when he says that he's the one who actually wrote the epistle. Uh, now, why, why am I bringing this up? Why is this important? The reason why it's important is because there are those who claim that your Bible is not perfect and that your Bible has errors in it. And one of the main causes of errors, according to this claim, one of the main causes of this errors and of these errors in the Bible is what they would call scribal errors. People just like Tertius who are writing this down and they simply wrote it down wrong. And because of that, uh, you have the very common belief today that, uh, and all Christians would agree, that the Bible is inspired by God. Every Christian would believe that. Uh, but because of this idea that the Bible is not perfect, the one you hold in your hand, uh, what the position tends to be is that they claim that the Bible is inspired by God but they add this, they say it is inspired by God, but only in the original manuscripts. They say, for example, the original manuscripts that Paul wrote were inspired by God through him, but the copies that are transcribed by scribes are not inspired and are subject to error. Now, do you see the problem with that position? The problem with that position is that Paul did not write the original. I think that that's a really big problem with that position. Uh, a scribe named Tertius actually heard Paul speak, and it was a scribe who copied the original manuscript. So. What do we mean exactly when we say that the scriptures are inspired? And this is a very important point because the Bible does not say that the scriptures are inspired. It actually doesn't say that. If you turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, look what it actually says. It reads, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's what it actually says. It doesn't say that all Scripture is inspired. It says all Scripture is given by inspiration. The way that it came to us was by inspiration. And the word inspiration means God breathed. It means it is something that is spoken. God spoke through Paul's mouth. Tertius 
is the one who copied it as a scribe onto the scroll. When those words are then written down, they become what we know as scripture. So whether they are a copy, whether they are in a different language, whether they're in the original language or whether they are in English, they are all given by inspiration. For some more evidence on that, if you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, it tells us, it gives us this is a very important passage because it really states more clearly the process of how the scriptures came to us. It says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It says, But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is how the scriptures actually came to us. Holy men, like Paul, they did not write. They spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That is how the scriptures came. These holy men would speak, and then scribes like Tertius were the ones who wrote them down. Listen, as soon as a scribe like Tertius puts pen to paper and he starts to copy the words of a holy man who is inspired by God who is speaking, as soon as he puts pen to paper and starts writing down this copy of Paul's words, We are not dealing so much with the doctrine of inspiration, but rather we're dealing with the doctrine of preservation, of God's ability to protect and to preserve his word from error. So the issue really is, does God preserve his word or does he not? Listen, if you believe that the inspiration and the preservation of scripture do not apply to those who have been, to those that have been written and copied by scribes but only to the originals then you have a real problem because Paul himself as it is with many of these books did not write the originals if you believe that scripture that has been copied is subject to error and is not protected by God's preservation then that would have to apply to the originals themselves. And then, of course, you're left with no Bible at all. The truth is, the moment that those inspired words left Paul's mouth, they were preserved and they were protected by God, not just for Tertius to write them down, but for all that would write them down all the way through history right until it lands in your hands. The Bible that you hold, as it tells us in the scripture itself, the Bible that you hold in your hand was given by inspiration and it is perfectly preserved for you. It was spoken by Paul, it was copied by Tertius, and it was delivered by Phoebe to the church that was in Rome, and it was delivered down through history right to you so that you can read it for yourself today. What, is, what exactly is the big deal? Well, the reason why it's a big deal is because Paul just told us that the reason why he wrote this letter is not just so that lost people can get saved, but he wrote it uh, so that Christians can be strengthened so that Christians can be established and be steadfast. That's the whole reason why he wrote it. He wrote it for believers so that we can sink our roots into the very doctrines and the words that hold us fast in our faith. My question is, how are we supposed to do that if we can't even trust the Bible that is in our hands? How are we supposed to do that? but you can trust it. Now that is the truth. You can trust it. You can sink your roots deep down into every single word that you read in this book. Every single, think about all the details that Paul goes into when he describes, for example, in Romans chapter five, how that this sin problem came through Adam and how it was solved through Christ and the detail of those specific words that he uses to show us that the way we got into this problem is exactly the way that we get out. 
the way he describes how that we should not continue in sin in Romans 6, and not only that, but the purposes of the law in chapter 7, and the relief and freedom that we have through the Spirit in chapter 8. There is so much detail that Paul goes into that we have to sink our roots into if we're going to be able to stand strong. And the only way that you can do that is if you know that every single word that you read here in this book came from God and has been perfectly preserved for you to study, for you to meditate on, for you to absorb, for you to sink your roots down deep into it. That is how you're able to stand strong. The way you stand strong is not just because you read it and because you know it, but because you can trust it. And you can trust it. What you hold in your hands is God's very words. And when you are established in the gospel, when your roots are deep in the gospel that is found right here in the book of Romans, it will transform you into a Christian who is steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's the reason why Paul wrote the book of Romans. I encourage you to go back and to dig your roots deep down into this book. This book is what will illuminate all other books. Everything else is kind of an extension of this book. And if you let your roots go deep down into this book, I promise you, it will transform you into a Christian that is always steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I know that's the kind of Christian that all of us want to be. In the weeks coming, we're going to be digging into a brand new study in the book of Esther. We've been so long for like two years. We did Acts and then we did Romans. We've been so long in the New Testament. My wife told me, you need to go back and look at some of the beautiful pictures that are in the old. And so that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to be taking the book of Esther and we're going to be pulling that apart. And we're going to be seeing some wonderful truths in that book. And I hope that you guys will join us for that study as well. Until next week, God bless you guys. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that video. Um, we would really appreciate it if you hit that like button and subscribe. And don't forget to share it with all your friends so we can reach a lot of people. And yeah.